Welcome to this month's installment of Brass Chats, brought to you by Monster Oil. What is this? 21 year? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Brass Chats. We've been trying to track this guy down for years, a really long time, and today is finally the day that it came together. We couldn't be more thrilled. Here he is, international soloist, two-time Juilliard grad, multi-time national trumpet competition and ITG competition winner, associate professor of trumpet at University of Texas at Austin, member of the Canadian Brass for over a decade. Oh yes, it's Caleb Hudson. All right. Thanks, Caleb. Sir. Thanks for being here, man. Oh, my pleasure, Joel. Thanks for having me. We want to start all the way back at the beginning. I'm curious, what were your biggest trumpet obstacles to overcome as you grew your skills? In other words, kind of what was really hard for you just oh, starting wow. out? Cool. Um, good to be here on Brass Chats. Thanks for having me here in Connecticut. Um, so I, I should probably go back to my first teachers um, because I think they really set me up with the structure that I needed to be able to really discover and work through my own challenges in my playing. So uh, Richard Bird was my first teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, started studying with him when I was 10 and then um, all the way until I left for Interlochen Arts Academy where I did two years of high school uh, with Ken Larson. And in between there I also uh, went down to Danville, Kentucky to take lessons with Vince DiMartino who uh, everybody knows. Uh, super generous teacher, player, amazing player. Uh, but Rich Bird really introduced me to how to practice, how to introduce structure in my practicing, making sure that I was not only um, making sure that every category of my trumpet playing was being addressed, but also that um, I was learning how to really think in a creative way. And the most important thing that I think he did for me was provide um, a really solid foundation of obsessive listening. So he would give me two or three albums a week to listen to, usually a classical album and a jazz album. I remember one week it would be a Doc Schitzer solo album uh, accompanied by a Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra album. And I would just, I would consume those recordings um, all day. And to the point where I think I, I had the Eratonian Concerto memorized by ear before I even looked at music because I was just listening to Doc Schitzer. And this is when you're 10? Uh, 10 through 12, yeah. Man. That's when he really started cultivating this listening approach. What and a head start that is. Say it again? What a head start that is to have that, it, yeah. that listening right away, the sound in your head right away. Yeah, and I think he, he had an intuition that kind of picked up uh, and noticed where my natural passions and artistic like inclinations were and he, he was smart enough to feed that and, and recognize that. Uh, in, in addition to introduce a, a balanced approach so that I was listening to the standard orchestral repertoire that I needed to know and listening to Mahler. And I remember the first orchestral recording I heard was Night on Bald Mountain and it just blew me away, that sound. Um, so I think developing that core, um, basically artistic landscape, like in your ear, I think Phil Smith calls it the inner Gabriel. It's like every time you pick up your horn, you know what you want to sound like. That has to be there or else when you do encounter an issue, a challenge, it's really hard to know which path to take because we all know there's so many things we can do. There's a lot of conflicting pedagogy out there. Um, it's like, do I breathe low or do I not breathe low? Do I play relaxed or do I play focused? <laughs> and there's a lot of different um, seemingly conflicting things out there. And if we don't have a solid foundation of what we want to sound like, um, then it's, it's really hard to, to, to be confident in our choices of how to move forward with any given uh, challenge in our playing. So um, I had to start there because I wanted to credit my teachers. And that was before, you know, before college, before I went to Juilliard and studied with Ray Mace and Mark Gould, who were like huge in my, in my uh, development. And each one of my teachers provided this super unique um, an invaluable perspective in my, in my, in my progress, and I, I really can, I can credit all of them equally, yeah. uh, with with their own kind of influence. I have a good, uh, <clears throat> all right. I, I have a question later that kind of dives into that just a little bit. Yeah. Um, just kind of about what each teacher offered you, but as far as just kind of the nuts and bolts 
of trumpet? I mean, so listening was obviously so huge for you early on. What about, I mean, I mean playing, it, it takes more than just hearing what it sounds like to, to translate into you know, good trumpet playing, even as a, a 10, 11, 12 year old. So what was, what was something that you worked on in the early days, you know, fundamentally on trumpet? What helped you get good at trumpet? Right, yeah. Yeah, so listening is, is so important because it, it captivates your imagination and it, that should really serve as the foundation of any time you go in the practice room. Not to say that you have to be super inspired and motivated every time you, you go do some work. I mean, <laughs> we all have to go through times of, of kind of plateaus in our playing, or even maybe it seems like a dip. Um, and we still have to get the work done. And discipline is the thing that carries us through those moments of where we lack inspiration. But um, for me, yeah, my first teacher, once again, instilled that discipline. So um, some, there were all, there was, there's definitely several pillars that I would always address. And it, was, it wasn't always with the same exercise, um, but it was, you know, long tones or, or flow exercises. And each one of these pillars had, had a very specific goal or goals that I would, you know, keep refreshing every day. Uh, lip flexibilities, articulation uh, infused with scales and developing that scale language in your ears, not just looking at scales and playing them. Um, and articulation, yeah. And then, um, so long tones, lip slurs, scales, a little buzzing as well. Uh, that came later on for me. Um, lip flexibilities and then, um, yeah. And then starting to learn the repertoire. What of that was easy for you? Like, what did you grasp right away? Like for me, I couldn't play lip stars. I avoided them basically, like I'm ashamed to say, until college. Because yeah. they were just, they felt like such hard work and I didn't have that sort of private teacher thing since I was 10, yeah. um, you know, that, that told me, you gotta, you gotta do that. So I didn't really discover them until later and I thought they were magic then, but before that, I just thought they were hard work and kind of crappy to do. Yeah. So, but, so that was what it would be for me, is just that's what was hard and like I didn't like. What came easily for you, what came hard for you back then? Yeah, sure. Uh, for me, what came naturally, initially, was the lyrical side of playing. And what, came, what was more challenging was the, the bravura, the, the soaring above the orchestra approach. And that was something that, that I had to figure out when I was at Juilliard, because I, was, um, I had success doing you know, solo playing and uh, the flexible stuff and the articulation. And, um, but, um, and that, you know, that was enough, sufficient to, to get me into a school like Juilliard. Um, but once I got there and was really trying to problem solve and, and shine light in the dark corners of my playing, uh, that's something I had to figure out. And that was a physical thing that really, um, I don't think any of my teachers was able to like look at me and diagnose because it wasn't something that they could, they could really see. But it was something I had to kind of figure out and problem solve and troubleshoot and basically put on a, <laughs> a, sci a research scientist hat and, and go in the laboratory and see what was going on. Pick like, pick like one of those and walk me through kind of the, the, the Cliff Notes version of how you address that. Shine a light in one of your dark corners and talk about how you show shown the light on it. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I can go into detail about, <laughs> about the physical aspect of, of what, was, what I was doing. Um, but, um, yeah, so essentially, I was uh, playing, I was shoving my bottom lip into my top teeth and playing through the gap in my teeth. And that's the way I was able to, I mean, I'm not going to say that's the main reason, but that's one of the reasons I was able to play lyrically and with control and flexibility. It's because I had this like <laughs> super uh, control over the airstream, yeah. but it wasn't a very large volume of air. So, um, so once I figured that out, I had... I kind of went a little too far in the other direction of, of opening everything up and opening the jaw and um, and then I lost control and that was that was weird because I was in Juilliard at the time and I was playing I remember one week I was playing Brandenburg in Lincoln Center and then I would go home and uh, in the practice room <laughs> I sounded like a like an 11 year old with this new trying this new embouchure I was trying to like cultivate these two different embouchures at the same time. And so it, yeah. it was really weird uh, to do that, but it introduced a lot of humility, and I, I'm actually really thankful for that. What, <clears throat> and maybe I'm projecting with this question, uh, I, I definitely am. What, um, how do you tell the difference between a fundamental deficiency in your approach and a bad day? You know what I mean? I can't get this to work today. Maybe I can't get it to work three times that week. Is that like a problem with my playing or did I just have three bad days? How do you, 
discern? It's kind of a crappily asked question, but do you, you know what I'm getting at? No, it's a good question. Yeah, how, yeah. Well, um, for me, if over an extended period of time, if all of the musical and conceptual thinking in the world isn't proving to show substantial progress in any area that you want to improve, then it's probably time to start introducing a little bit of analytical thinking into the mix. And I know a lot of brass players and teachers are understandably cautious about that because they are weary of, um, they're cautious about approaching in an overly analytical mindset because if you do that without that foundational layer of musicality and artistic you know, confidence, and knowing what you want to sound like every time you pick up your horn, if you do it without that, then you can be lost and it can lead to negative results. Um, because you get into the weeds without having a, a solid foot in the musical. Um, but if, there's a, if, there, if you come across an issue and you're playing um, that no amount of musical expressive thinking or no amount of thinking about your air or these conceptual ideas of flow and, um, and, and just, uh, you know, these musical imagery <laughs> can deal with, then it, it's time to start thinking on more nuts and bolts terms. Yeah. And, and I think you really need a mentor and a guide to, to help you through that process. Um, and that's something that, that I definitely balance in my teaching. So with my students, the, the musical aspect is so, so important. And if I think a student really isn't listening to much music, which a lot of my students, <laughs> they're not listening to nearly as much music as they should, um, I'll start introducing that as assignments, uh, weekly assignments. You know, I'll drop the needle in an album and they have to name the composer, the artist, the piece, <laughs> um, the movement. And, um, and I hope that it grows into like a, something that they take ownership over artistically. But uh, that has to be there before I can start to address, oh, here's an embouchure issue. Here's, a, you know, here's something that's going on inside your oral cavity that we need to, to discover. You know, um, so for sure, your approach to trumpet problem solving is to find musical solutions to technical problems. That sounds like your primary layer. The first thing you look at is, is there a musical solution to this thing that's giving you a hard yeah, time? Yeah, I absolutely think that should be the first, the first approach. I mean, unless there's a, an obvious issue, like if someone's playing on the red of their top lip, yeah. like no amount of thinking about Miles Davis is going to solve that. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it would. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Um, <clears throat> so with all that in mind, and you know, a lot of lip service is given to making everything feel easy. A lot of people, a lot of teachers do that, myself included. You want trumpet to be as easy as possible for you. Do you find that trumpet feels easy? Is that a goal of yours? Um, I mean, it's certainly audible in your approach. Everything you play sounds easy, natural, conversational. Well, um, that was, I think that conversational word is something that the three of us, last time Canadian Brass was in town, uh, when we came and heard you, that was, we were just like, everything just sounds just like an easy conversation. Um, so you can hear it when you play. Is ease kind of always your primary goal? Um, well, thank, I appreciate that. Yeah, um, yeah ease is, uh, no, it's not my primary goal. Uh, I, I hope it's a byproduct of, of good flow and musicality. But um, my primary goal is to... Um, is a connection with the audience and to present the music in a captivating, meaningful way. Um, and to be honest, like we're all trumpet players, sometimes we enjoy seeing a little difficulty, right? Like sometimes we that adds, you really that chemistry adds to the the performance. So uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I remember seeing Maynard play at NTC, and like there's something about the the hero vibe <laughs> that yeah. that speaks to an audience. That's a um, so seeing the performer kind of encounter a struggle on stage and like, not, not to say Maynard was struggling, but. <laughs> to, well, I, I will say he did not make it look as easy as you make it look. Oh man, well. With nothing was, against Maynard. It's he was an doing a lot. <laughs> he, he was on another level what yeah. he was do, doing. Uh, but um, yeah, so I, I think ease, as I've, as I've focused on finding more efficiency in my playing, um, yeah, things have gotten easier. And um, I think that's a byproduct of prioritizing the right things. I don't think ease is always, if ease is your goal every day when you practice the trumpet, I think you're, you're, that you're kind of down the path to maybe sterile playing. Like I think 
your, your goal should be always trying to approach that kind of musical image in your mind. And the beautiful thing about playing trumpet or really any musical pursuit is that your level and your imagination like are both growing, but one is exponential and the other one is very, very gradual. So they're always getting further apart and that might seem a little depressing, but it's, <laughs> for me, it's actually really, really fun. That's part of the, the fun of the, the process. The chase, yeah. yeah. Um, what's something you have to reteach yourself on trumpet every day? Mm. If such a thing exists for you. Yeah, um, well, I guess I can speak about lately, um, and I have to credit my friend, Dr. Jordi Albert. Um, he's from Spain originally, living in Mexico now. Um, but he's been, um, you know, since I graduated from Juilliard in 2012, I haven't really been taking lessons regularly. But, um, but recently I've had uh, Dr. Albert come work with my students in Texas. Uh, he's visited like three or four times in the last year. And he stays with me uh, at my house. And, uh, you know, I ask him, like, hey, can you just, like, help me, like, watch me practice and tell me what you see? Um, and so he'll just sit there for two hours and, like, he has this background in, like, neuromechanics. And um, he, more than anyone else, has a very intuitive understanding of, of brass playing. And, and he, he, can, he knows all the details. But the way he communicates it is a, a very intuitive musical way. So um, one thing that he's helped me with is actually singing through the instrument. So it's like you'll put the horn up, you'll form an embouchure just like usual, but you'll sing. Um, and that, what that does is it helps you to introduce ease into your playing without really thinking about it. Um, and then you, you can naturally, um, it's pretty amazing. You can immediately see the results in your playing when, when you go back and forth between singing, kind of just not really analyzing what's going on, but uh, basically absorbing the sensations of what it feels like to sing as you're doing the fingerings, and then try to replicate those sensations as you're playing, playing the trumpet. So that's something I've been doing to, uh, and that's helped me with immediacy of flow, uh, reducing like any throat tension has, has been huge for me. Because yeah. I've realized like I get my throat involved more than I should in my playing. Me too. This yeah. last like six months, that's one thing that I'm, I'm just like, I have no endurance because I feel like I'm, you know, maybe it's keeping my tongue high in the back, you know, for one, for high stuff yeah. or playing first parts or whatever. But just that whole thing and it, it, it bleeds down into your throat. You start cutting off air and stuff like that. So. All right. right. Tip, yeah, yeah. Uh, tip accepted. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on that. What's <laughs> cool. your? I'm curious. What's your? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. You mean literally singing. Yeah, singing through the horn. Yeah. So, so you put it up and yeah, play while singing through the instrument. They talk about <coughs> different things. But you mean literally putting the horn up, making an aperture, not buzzing, and singing instead. Yeah. So you'll ooh, sing through the bell, and um, you don't have to sing in the octave. Actually, he he talks about singing in the lowest octave possible to to promote like ease and flow on the playing. So you're and thinking about the music and not how bad your voice is or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you're making an embouchure at the same time. Yeah, you're, and you're making an embouchure and you're singing through, you're not singing out the corners, you're singing through the bell of the horn. It's very important. So, um, yeah, I mean, I hope I'm doing his, <laughs> his pedagogy justice, but he's, uh, that's just one little nugget that I've, I've gotten from him. He's pretty amazing. Wow. That's, I never would have thought of that. Um, that's cool. What's your warm up like every day? How do you get ready to, to play? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I'm not a pianist, but usually if there's a piano in the room, I'll start at the piano <laughs> and just kind of like improvise for a little while. Um, yeah, I, I can never resist that for some reason. But um, I don't know, that's just kind of, I. it's not really intentional, but I try to get my like creativity flowing first, um, whether that's playing piano, making stuff up or, uh, or listening to recordings um, and just trying to, to imitate that sound. Um, there's something about like w listening to, you know, Phil Smith play. When I hear Phil Smith play, it's the ease in his playing. You can kind of feel it as you listen to it. You know, I don't know. I think a lot of trumpet players can resonate with that. Yeah, it's very visceral to listen to. Phil. Yeah. Yeah. And so I remember yeah, if I'm, if I'm feeling like I need to pr introduce a little bit more ease into my approach, I'll put on a recording of someone that I feel really captures it. Like Phil Smith, like Matthias Hofs, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll try to replicate that, um, even from the very first notes of the day. Because otherwise, <laughs> the last recording, the last 
trumpet sounds you listen to is likely yourself. And who wants to sound like themselves? <laughs> <laughs> here, here. Uh, so the warm up, sorry, I can go into that more no, detail, no, okay. I guess. Um, so I, you know, I used to think that I needed like an hour warm up when I was in school. And I think that was a psychological thing. But um, then I joined Canadian Brass and we didn't have that luxury all the time. Actually, pretty rarely did we have an hour. Uh, so sometimes we get off an airplane and, and have to go straight to the performance without a warm-up and you're warm up, warming up on your mouthpiece in the car. And, uh, that happened last year when we went to Midwest. We were delayed in Wyoming for hours and then we had to hop, hop in the taxi and go right to, uh, to the Midwest clinic and play without a warm-up. So. Oh, that small little gig? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so now it's, it's usually, I mean, whatever I have I'll, I'll take, but 20 to 30 minutes is great. Um, I start with just a little bit of mouthpiece buzzing and each one of these things has, has specific goals. So I'll do very soft sirens, you know, basically I approach it like ironing a shirt. You want to iron out the wrinkles in your range and, and your range of motion between your ranges so that um, you're not introducing any excess uh, pressure or tension into the mix. So you're basically trying to find balance. I think Hogan Hardenberger, who you guys all know, uh, I think he talks about it in his there's a documentary on YouTube uh, from a while ago where, where he's saying his first notes, I think, are like a violinist approaching the, the bow to the string, finding that perfect balance. And I think that's a really good analogy to think about when we try to find our sound and, and the feel. And I think when your, your feel and the sound, um, when they both, when, you, when it feels easy and the, the, the sound just rings with a fullness and immediacy, um, those are both good indicators that you're promoting efficiency. So after buzzing, I'll go to some flow Chigowitz uh, studies, um, and then I'll do some col colon lip flexibilities, um, and then some scales and articulation. And uh, usually, if I play piccolo trumpet, I'll do like two minutes, and that's about it. Just are you on scales. the piccolo every day? No. Really? No. It's um, <clears throat> only only really in preparation for a. A concert, so um, it is kind of a different. Yeah, you, we all you all know it's it's a different set of chops, I guess, to play piccolo concerto. But um, like this this concert I'm doing, I'm in town right now doing an album release concert, and um, it was a really hard <laughs> Corelli uh, sonata that I arranged for this ensemble, and um, the piccolo part is just really grueling, and I've no one but myself to blame for arranging it that way, <laughs> but. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so I feel like whether it's preparing for something like that or the Brandenburg, I have to really get into piccolo shape for ideally at least two weeks before a show, you know. Yeah. But if I don't have piccolo coming up, um, I don't find it necessary to, to really practice piccolo regularly. However, I, I have had students that benefit from playing high horns every day. Uh, some, some even like starting on an E flat or piccolo trumpet because mm -hmm. there's something about the higher the horn, the more it'll illuminate like inefficiencies. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for some students, especially students that tend to like collapse, you know, or don't have enough support, um, I think starting uh, the day on a high horn can sometimes be benef beneficial. Yeah. So I've seen you in concert a few times now, uh, plus one for tomorrow. Um, endurance never seems to be a struggle for you, even in the slightest. Has that ever been an issue for you? And if it has, you know, kind of what's your secret? How did you develop the endurance to make it sound easy all the way through a long Canadian brass show? Yeah, so I can talk about that. Um, so um, endurance. So yeah, endurance with Canadian brass, um, that was definitely f like, a, on the forefront of my mind when I first joined the group in 2013, because it's um, it's a grueling show and there's a lot of switching between between instruments. For some reason, I found that like going from piccolo to like flugelhorn was always weird because you have that deep cup in the flugel and it's just so different from playing piccolo. But um, you get used to it, and um, I know a lot of players like to keep the same rim size between all their instruments and. Uh, I kind of just got used to, to switching, and I know Chris Coletti did the same thing, um, from small piccolo mouthpiece to a, a large, you know, B flat mouthpiece. But um, for me, it's just something uh, that the endurance aspect. Um, 
I would say there's, there's a balance of a few different factors. Like I was, I was working on my own to always find more efficiency. But like I said, music was always the goal. So when I was on stage and I was starting to feel tired, I would try to take the focus off myself and, and focus on really trying to make my colleagues sound better or, uh, or make the group sound better instead of the more you put the spotlight on yourself, the more kind of suffocating that can be. So that's one of the beautiful things about chamber music is, is you can do that in the moment when, when things are feeling a little uh, vulnerable, you can refocus on the, the group, the collective, instead of your individual you know, um, insecurities. Focusing into advice you have for other players. Uh, it's, this question is a three-parter, uh, and it has beginner, intermediate, and advanced. That's the three parts. So the question is, what's something you think every beginner trumpet player needs to hear? Oh, yeah. Just yeah. about their approach, or you know, what do you think every beginner player could benefit from you telling them? Good, good, good. Um, okay, so for you beginners out there, <laughs> um, I think it's really, really important to kind of feed your imagination. So. Like I said, you need to be listening constantly and follow your interests, um, but also make sure that you're balancing your listening with you know, the staples of a repertoire and introduce yourself to all different types of music, um, not just the orchestral music, or not just jazz, but everything. Um, and then as you, as you grow and as you mature as a, as a musician, as an artist, you'll notice that your interests and your source of inspiration kind of start to become more diverse so it might start off being you know the albums of the amazing albums of Maurice Andre and then you're listening to Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra right and then you start listening to Roy Hargrove and then you're listening to uh, all the Mahler symphonies and that turns into like a Messian obsession and then all of a sudden you're like watching ballet and getting inspiration from that I mean I find I find inspiration just watching like beautiful cinematography and the way that um, you know, they'll, they'll use lighting in a very kind of intentional way, and then that will kind of transfer to my, my playing or my writing. And, um, and so, you, yeah, as you grow as an artist, you, you start to, to get inspiration from everywhere. Surround yourself with players that are better than you. So it's so important not just to listen to great music, but actually to be surrounded and immersed in that. And that's one of the great things about being in a studio. Um, that sounds like getting into the second part, which yeah. is what's something you think every intermediate trumpet players I would call late high school maybe even undergrad sure you know, an intermediate trumpet player working on advanced but so surround yourself with better players for sure absolutely I mean one of the best things about being in a studio and this can happen at any university studio or conservatory studio is you kind of you get thrown into this mix where um, everyone has a different skill set and what's what's uh, someone else's strength might be your weakness and vice versa. So um, you can really learn from that. If you have the right attitude, you can learn from that. And um, in the right kind of studio environment, which I try to cultivate in my studio at UT, um, there's this immense support and a familial environment where people can be vulnerable with their weaknesses because they know that when they go up and play this etude that they're struggling with a little bit, they're going to, they know that everyone listening has their back, you know, and that they're not listening with these overly critical, um, negatively critical ears. There should be a critical mindset, obviously, and there needs to be competition. But um, the, the chemistry of a good studio is so, so important in an individual's growth, and that's something that I really, really try to protect. So if I have a student come to audition for the program that can play moto perpetuo you know flawlessly <laughs> but they, there's a there's a concern there about like them poisoning the environment that we've worked so hard to build then I take that very very seriously yeah um, all right and then the last part is what's something you think every advanced trumpet player needs to hear you know the three of us we have jobs playing trumpet um, you know everybody in a military band or an orchestra what do you think is something that needs to be said to all of us yeah I mean I think I have to say it to myself uh, a lot, but um, you know, with this project, this this album that I'm releasing, uh, Mark Gould was a huge inspiration uh, and a huge part of this project. So um, I'm realizing more and more now how important it is as you get older to have a, a coach. You know, 
I mean, if you look at like the Metropolitan Opera stars, you know, these, they all have coaches that travel with them and, and give them feedback and, and these artists treasure their, their feedback. Um, and that's the way I feel about my teachers too. And when I have someone like Mark Gould, he just came to my album release concert in Austin and uh, he was at the sound check and, you know, providing just great feedback about balance, but also about just musical, you know, um, intuition and, uh, you know, no one can really communicate artistically like Mark Gould. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's really important is to always kind of have that humility in, in your approach so that you're always really learning and kind of making sure that your imagination is always kind of staying on fire. Yeah. Shifting gears a little bit to kind of your experience in education, some of those, those types of things. Um, you had lots of success on the competition circuit. Uh, said all your accolades at the beginning, but you know, with ITG, NTC, the um, you know, first place ensembles, you know, that festive overture video, everybody's seen that. You arranged it, you played on it, it's great. Um, what made you such a successful competitor? Um, do you approach it differently than the art that you normally make? Um, and then what did you learn most overall from those competition experiences? That's a good question. Do you, do you approach it differently from other performances? Ideally, you approach a competition with the same musical out, outlook as a performance at your local church. But, um, <clears throat> but yeah, there's a, a different kind of element there. There's a different um, motivation. And I think uh, the more we can... Um, kind of be honest with ourselves about what that motivation is uh, and the more we can get to uh, a more pure motivation I think the better our performance will be you know that's one that's one of the paradoxes of improvement is like the more accurate you try to be the more you know the more you try to pursue this um, ego-based success you know showing people what you can do uh, the more insecurity that brings um, but when you you're centered around trying to provide a connection with your audience, trying to share something with your audience. Um, the byproduct of those priorities is usually accuracy. And, and the byproduct of musical thinking is flow. And the byproduct of, um, of you know, these kind of pure, honest intentions are the things that you were approaching in the first place. So um, that's, that's one thing that I found in my playing. Um, it's really hard to do. I think it takes a lot of, of time. And I think it's a never ending process of maturing. But um, yeah, I mean, I remember the competitions. I mean, I, I definitely had my share of, of disappointments and competitions. And I, I, yeah, I didn't always like react um, the best way. I think a young player experiencing like rejection at, and um, failure can lead to some really, you know, staring at yourself in the mirror moments where you're trying to evaluate like, do I have what it takes? You know, um, is this worth it? Is this coming from a, a, a genuine place or is it just me trying to, you know, to rise to the top? <laughs> um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's really, really important to, to really have those moments of reflection when you, f you have that perceived failure. So um, that def I'm definitely grateful for those moments. I mean, I, um, and I'm still grateful for those moments of, of humility <laughs> because it's, it's, it's a nice kind of wake up call um, to, uh, so, that, so that it keeps you, keeps you honest, you know. Um, without talking about your teachers just yet, mm -hmm. what were some of your biggest takeaways from your time at Juilliard? Like, for example, what's something you learned at Juilliard that, that really changed your perspective? You were surprised yeah. that you learned there. You never would have thought you were going to learn it when you, when you went in. Oh, sure. Um, one of the best things about Juilliard was the, uh, I was in an amazing brass motet that I started with <coughs> my friends. And um, let's see, we had a few members kind of rotate through that group, but uh, Stuart Stevenson was in that group. So, yeah, principal in Dallas Symphony now. Amazing player, and um, we would uh, we would go all throughout the five boroughs of New York and perform these outreach concerts. And we would have to curate the program, and I would arrange a lot of the music myself. And um, there's so many elements of, of putting a program like that together, and learning how to speak in front of an audience, and learning what worked and what didn't in terms of repertoire or the progression of repertoire. 
Uh, we were playing at you know, psych wards, we were playing at homeless shelters, we were playing at schools, a bunch of um, venues. A lot of them were underserved venues. And so um, really having the, the privilege of, of getting that connection with, with the audience, mostly an audience that wasn't familiar with classical music, um, was a big learning experience. You know, not to mention the learning how to communicate within our ensemble and be respectful and, and balance, you know, musical goals with interpersonal goals. And um, that's a huge, I mean, if you're in, in a program and you're not in chamber music, you're missing out because that's, I think, I believe it's the most important way to grow as a musician and as a communicator. So jumping to the side for the outreach, because <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about that. Um, what do you find was the most effective um, things that, that just people at those shows latched onto, you know, especially for audiences that aren't exposed to, you know, what you're, I mean, you, you can come to an audience where you're selling tickets and everyone knows who Caleb Hudson is and they're going to love it because yeah. they're already, but you're going somewhere, they don't know who you are, they don't know where you came from, maybe you, you're not the same color skin as them, maybe you obviously are a different income level, maybe you are not in a psych ward right now, so you're obviously different from them, um, you know. How do you connect with those people? What did you find like was really successful yeah. in getting their ears and, and hearts? Yeah, you know, one thing that um, we realized pretty quickly was that we had these kind of preconceived notions of what kind of music these audiences would, would like. And it was never accurate. Like we thought, oh, you know, they're not gonna be able to sit through Jan Bach, <laughs> you know. Um, but um, yeah, it was really about our approach. If we approach it in a way where we kind of believed in the music, uh, and at least we had a compelling performance, then the audience usually latched onto it. So, you know, I thought, you know, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna love this, you know, NFL Fox theme that I arranged for the Brass Quintet. <laughs> and, but the thing they would talk about most was like this Debussy, you know, piece um, after the concert, and how that connected with them. Because I think we, you know, if we show heart in what we do, and we, we show, we kind of like show artistic ownership of it, you know, individually and as a group. I think that resonates with the audience, whether you're playing Etler, okay, maybe not Etler, <laughs> <laughs> or you're playing, I don't know, uh, something popular, like the Pirates of the Caribbean theme that we did every concert. <laughs> <clears throat> Looking back through today's lens, you know, give me kind of the snapshot version of what each of your teachers kind of gave you. Um, so let's just go down the list. Rich Bird. Okay, yeah, I'll try my best to do snapshots, although it's a really I know, it's much so, fuller picture. I know, it's so deep, yeah, yeah. But uh, Rich Bird provided this foundation that it just introduced me into the world of, of this musical landscape that I didn't, didn't know existed, and in addition to the structure of a, a really balanced practice session. Uh, Vince DiMartino, do you want me to say the names or you? Uh, I have okay. the set of names, I think, but yeah, okay. yeah definitely yeah, yeah. say the names. Yeah, Vince DiMartino. Yeah, Vince DiMartino um, really helped lead by example in terms of a community. I mean, he's world renowned, but he's he's a member of the community first and foremost. And so, um, someone who doesn't know about Vince DiMartino in the trumpet world will know that he's you know playing every weekend on the Danville <laughs> bandstand downtown, and you can go up to him and talk to him about. The cornet he's playing that week. <laughs> um, so that generosity and just community spirit. Uh, Ken Larson at the Interlochen Arts Academy. Uh, Ken Larson is amazing, and, and uh, he really, really helped catalyze um, an approach to playing where I was being analytical and getting into the details and not afraid to get into the weeds of playing. Yeah. Um, Ray Mace at Juilliard. Ray Mace. Uh, I remember I was in high school and I would fall asleep listening to his trumpet vocalese album and just getting that sound in my ear. So he was my hero before I even met him and had a lesson with him and then went to Juilliard and studied with him. Um, but Ray, um, Ray really helped cultivate that structure as well. Very, very good for an undergraduate player, for any player, but um, for me, cultivating a, a structure and a, an ear for the details was really, really important, and making sure I was solidifying my musical ideas as well. Um, and then Mark Gould, who I studied with for three years. I studied with Ray Mace for three years, and then Mark Gould for three years, because I did both degrees at Juilliard. Uh, Mark Gould 
uh, introduced, he just kind of shifted my, my vision, my perspective, musical perspective, so that I wasn't afraid to look at my playing or my writing or my programming in a lot of different ways. Um, so whether I was preparing for an orchestral audition or I was curating a brass ensemble program or preparing this, you know, kind of adventurous recital, um, he, his kind of musical expertise and artistic perspective was, was really, really important. In addition to, like I said, none of my teachers really got into the weeds with me in terms of my embouchure issues. Um, because they, they didn't really know what was going on. I didn't know what, everything that was going on, but, um, but they, uh, they each had an influence in that. And Mark Gould, he would have these kind of nuggets of information every week when I went in, and I would, you know, one week would be very art, artistic based, and I would be talking about programming ideas, and the next week I'd be talking about my struggles with, with playing and the amateur development. And he would have these nuggets of, of just ideas that would carry me through the week. And I would keep coming back to them and they would help center me, you know. So, um, yeah, and still, you know, my teachers provide a lot, of, uh, a lot of great feedback. And then the one teacher that might not be on your list is John Thiessen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, he is? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> the research. Nice. John Thiessen was my Baroque trumpet teacher at Juilliard. Mm -hmm. So they started the Baroque program when I was a junior there. And um, they had two Egger Baroque trumpets. And me and my friend Tim Will uh, both checked out the, the horns. And the school paid for lessons with uh, John Thiessen. So in addition to my lessons, uh, classical modern lessons, I was taking Baroque lessons. And it was amazing because John introduced me to that Baroque world. And in my opinion, that's be the best music written for trumpet is the Bach and the Handel and the Telemont, all the Baroque music from, <laughs> from those greats. Haven't improved on it in 250 years. That's right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. You were, I think, speaking of research, I think you were, were you 25 when you joined the Canadian Brass? Yes, it was, yeah. So was you were 25 when you joined the Canadian Brass. Uh, what was it like, especially in those first few months, you know, kind of following in the footsteps of those giants, you know, Ronnie Rahm, Fred Mills, Ryan Anthony, everybody else that's been yeah. there. What was that like for you? Wow, uh, it was huge. I mean, we, we had all grown up listening to that group. So they had a legacy, they're, kind of, they're legendary. Um, and so it was, uh, it was amazing, it was humbling. Um, I just didn't, you know, I didn't want to take away from this momentum that they had, <laughs> had been building for, what, for 40 years? Yeah, 40 plus years at the time. And um, so I was, I was trying to balance um, jumping on this moving train, but also um, trying to contribute in whatever way I could without taking away from um, a very clearly defined you know, vision for the group. And so I think that balance is something that a lot of uh, established groups or institutions you know, that, that, they, that there's a struggle there because it's like, how do we preserve what has connected with our audiences for so long while still maintaining this in, innovative approach that led us to this success any, to begin with, right? So um, that's, uh, that's something that the group has always been open-minded about. And um, yeah, I've learned so much about all of the details outside of playing your trumpet that go into putting on a concert, interacting with the community. Um, making those events successful. So uh, it was a huge learning, learning curve. Yeah. Uh, how, if at all, do you feel Canadian brass changed you as a trumpet player? Mm. Well, um, it provided, I mean, there's the, the playing aspect of it, which was you know, building endurance, um, building my mental focus so I could stay you know, focus through a two hour concert, uh, reprioritizing my, reprioritizing my goal so that my goal was not about myself, getting it in, uh, connect, connecting with the audience, making sure that I was really um, making my colleagues, um, building them up in performance. I'm curious, just yeah. how do you, do you, does that part ever get said out loud, like in rehearsal? Well, like like that, that kind of abstract stuff, because we talked about a lot of the abstract ways that yeah. you improve as a musician, as a trumpet player. You know, let the music solve your problems for you. Let, let the, let the um, connection with the audience um, 
guide, you know, be your North Star for these moments. Like, do you guys say that out loud or is that something that's just kind of like innately known in all of you? It's part of the culture of the group. Yeah. So I don't know if it's really explicitly talked about in rehearsal, but it's, it's always on the forefront of, my, of our mind when we're programming. Um, but it's definitely the culture of the group. Um, it's, it's, it's never about like, it's never about becoming a, a solo feature show, you know. And if we f if we find that our program is veering towards featuring someone too much, um, we kind of reevaluate and we we're like, is this like, do we have good intentions behind this, or is it becoming like the, you know, solo tuba show? No, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. never about that. But that usually, usually email. it's a little t trumpet heavy, to be mm -hmm. honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's probably intertwined with our trumpet egos. <laughs> but. Uh, Achilles has his share of solos too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He can play more virtuosic than trumpet players. So. <laughs> uh, what mark do you feel that you left on Canadian brass? Oh, I just hope I didn't <laughs> screw him up too much. <laughs> no, I. Uh, what mark do I think I? I le I'm just honored to be a part of that legacy. When I think about Ronnie and Freddie and Ryan and Jens and all these players that were in the group before me, I mean, there's a much longer list of trumpet players. And then, and, no, 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 no. And then the, the players that I was able to play with, Chris Coletti and Brandon right now, those two especially, um, it was just, uh, it was a growing experience for me. And I was just constantly inspired by, by them, by all of them in multiple different ways, not just artistically, but like the amount of knowledge I learned from watching Chuck, you know, um, was, was really, really, Amazing, yeah. Well, the the one thing that I was really happy to do was um, see like my writing and my arranging come to life in that group, and that's a really rare experience. Um, and that's something that I kind of grew into. I never took formal arranging classes in in school or writing, but um, I'm glad that I I kind of ventured down that path. And we didn't play everything that I, I wrote, you know. Sometimes things would, we'd read through something in rehearsal and realize it wouldn't work, or we'd, I'd have to keep tweaking it to, to really fit our group. Um, but to see it come to life in performance was, was really neat. So, yeah, I, I, I'm really grateful for that. Um, <clears throat> you are really well known for your, all of your playing, but especially your piccolo playing these days, as far as views online or whatever else. I mean, it's just, it's so far and above so much of what else is out there. And it's so many people go to your recordings and your videos to hear what a piccolo trumpet is supposed to sound like. I'm curious, when did that become a gravity point for you where you just said, oh, this is something special that I got. I'm going to, I'm going to dive into this for, I'm going to see how far I can take, you know, my pick playing, how far I can stretch the arrangements that I do for mm -hmm. pick. Um, so just speaking specifically about piccolo trumpet and what kind of drove your hunger and, and gravity to that for your career. I see. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I didn't really have a focus on piccolo until really mid, midway through Juilliard undergrad. Um, and that's, I don't know, that's, I guess that's when I started focusing my attention toward that. Uh, <laughs> I think for the longest time, I. I thought Brandenburg was like, I'm just, I'm just not ready for Brandenburg, not ready for Brandenburg. And then I, one day I just like asked myself, like, why haven't I approached that piece in particular? Just because within the trumpet community, it's kind of been put on this pedestal as yeah. this. And it is, I mean, it is. There's, just, you know, people have gotten brain aneurysms from that piece. <laughs> <laughs> Your own bio calls it infamous, I think. <laughs> oh, really? So I'll call you out. You're, okay. you're, you're contributing to I the pedestal. Write that, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it is. It's not, it's the I truth. That's how it is. That, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, um, I, I started approaching that piece, and then I, you know, Ray Mace, through that, my connection with my teacher, Ray Mace, um, I was able to perform that with the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. And that was, um, my first performance was at my, I think it was at my senior recital. But then after that, um, Ray hooked me up with a gig at Lincoln Center. And, um, and then from then on, I guess, that's when I really uh, pursued it. And um, yeah, I, I, that's one thing that um, in my playing where I didn't really feel like I had to problem solve. Um, my piccolo playing. You know, there's a lot of other things that I, that I had to problem solve, 
But the piccolo playing is, is something that um, I guess was more natural. But I still have to make sure that I'm in, in shape for it and uh, developing the piccolo chops to get through Brandenburg. For a piece like that, I try to make sure that before a performance, I can do it two times through and, and make it, you know. And then if I can do that, I feel pretty confident. So moving into kind of a teaching focused, uh, you know, yeah. round of questions here. I'm wondering what the three most common flaws you encounter uh, when you're teaching a master class are. Oh, okay. Um, are we talking about trumpet specific? Or yeah, well, anything? I mean, anything. I mean, you're oh, teaching okay. a master class uh, tonight or tomorrow up at Hart. So, you know, what do you think yeah. in a master class like that you typically commonly encounter from yeah. the people that play for you? Okay. Off the top of my head, um, I would say the main thing is a disconnect between. Um, you know, what's going on inside their head and what they're getting, what, what's coming out of the horn. So there's like some barrier between what, the, sorry, there, there's some barrier between what they perceive musically and what they're expressing through the horn. And um, if you think about like all your favorite players, even just all your favorite trumpet players, uh, when I think about that, there's, the trumpet is just an extension of their, you know, their musical voice. And you see that with Nikaryakov, you see it with Dokshitzer, I guess it's all the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you, see it, you see it with all of them. You see it with Matthias, you see it with Brandon Reidenauer, you see it with Wynton Marsalis. I mean, there's, the trumpet is just a vehicle for expression. And that is something that um, has to be the priority in, in developing your playing every day. Uh, not just about making it e easier. Th that is important, but I, that's not. That's usually a byproduct of, of the musical thinking. So that l that um, lack of, I guess, strong musical focus is is um, and connection is the main thing. Uh, when we coach chamber ensembles, it's um, once again. I can get into more physical trumpet details too, but it's always it always starts with the musical. So it's a lack of a uh, cohesive ensemble, you know, musical vision uh, and connection between the players. So um, I always encourage my the groups that I that I coach to make sure that you're spending time together outside of rehearsal, listening to music together, you know, or even just getting to know each other. You know, it's amazing how much better you play with each other after you get to know each other a little bit outside of rehearsal, um, and then you can feel comfortable starting to take musical risks and maybe verbalize your musical thoughts and, and explore the, the, those things together. Um, and then I would say on a trumpet level, soft playing is neglected. And, um, and yeah, soft playing is really, really, really neglected. And I think that through a great approach in soft playing, um, that really cultivates great efficiency. And if you can play loud and make it feel soft, then you know you're doing it right. What's the biggest mistake you see teachers making with their students, and how would you do it differently? I'm not, I don't presume to have a better pedagogy than any of my colleagues. Uh, I think you can learn from a lot of teachers' approaches. But when you think about the different, like how many different layers there are between a teacher's kind of understanding of pedagogy and then the way they express it, <laughs> that's already there's there's room for um, you know for inconsistencies from what they perceive is working to the way they express what's working to that getting to the students ears <laughs> and their understanding of what the, the teacher is saying and then their application of what the teacher is saying that's like four layers of potential misunderstanding it's so, the same thing you talked about with the trumpet with the yeah. master classes there's a barrier between what they think is happening and what's coming yeah, out of their belly for sure. yeah, yeah. so that's when you when you hear when you hear a student, uh, when you hear a teacher tell you, okay, relax when you play, just ultimate relaxation, that can be, that can be 100% accurate in the way that the teacher intends to portray it or the way the teacher uh, really understands it. But the way it might reach a student's ears can translate to like an overly collapsed way of playing, you know, where they don't have the necessary balance of structure to play in, in the most efficient way. And I think relaxation in its most truest form is balance. So um, as teachers, we have to keep finding um, new ways for every student to understand the substance of what we're trying to communicate. 
So um, that's the way I express an idea to one student might be completely different uh, from how I express that to maybe a DMA student, for example. All right, I gotta ask it. We get it all the time from all of our interviews. Everybody yeah. wants to know it. It's probably the most commonly asked trumpet question on earth. Yeah. You've probably heard it yourself a lot of times. What's the secret to playing high notes? Just what is it? Just tell us. What's the secret? <laughs> the secret is that there's no secret. But um, Ray Mace always said, like, find, your, um, find the boundaries of your comfort zone and then just push that just little by little. I think a lot of players, we're impatient by nature, trumpet players. So we, we see a problem and we go right to the chaos zone, right? So if you think about your playing in terms of one sphere is your comfort zone and outside that is the growth zone, outside of that is panic zone, chaos zone, right? And a lot of us approach the high range going straight to the chaos zone. Uh, and what we should do is find out where we're doing things with a natural efficiency, you know, and slightly push those boundaries so that we always have one foot grounded in what we know and one foot kind of dipping our toe in in this, you know, ocean of chaos. <laughs> What's the best vehicle for that? Is it, is it scales? Is it Clark studies in the growth zone once you've established that? Like what, yeah. what do you, what's the best way to spend time in the growth zone, do you Personally, think? Personally, and the way I teach is through a, a different, approaching the high range through different perspectives. Um, so I think when you approach high range, and shout out to Charlie Porter, because I think he, in my opinion, the way he explains how the trumpet works and how our embouchure works is spot on. Um, and I don't know, uh, maybe elements of it aren't, but in my experience, everything that I've applied from my understanding of his teaching and the way I've applied it to my students has been really, really beneficial. So if you haven't watched his like how to form an amateur video and don't be afraid, first of all, to click on those videos, but be very cautious with some of the, some, some videos out there, <laughs> be very cautious because there's a lot of conflicting pedagogy, but Charlie Porter's video, videos and his understanding of of that is has been a huge help pandolfi your your guys's video of pandolfi has been the most recommended video of trumpet pedagogy that i've given to my students oh, so man. congrats on that because uh, i had one lesson with him when he came to juilliard um, and did a master class and his conceptual approach to playing trumpet resonates with me more than really anybody so um if you have those are two video recommendations for all you all and uh, have, you guys, have you guys done a Charlie Porter interview yet? We have not done okay. Charlie Porter. We want to get to him, though. Yeah, man. He's, he's amazing. I'd love to chat with him for a couple hours. But, um, but anyway, so approaching the high range from a, a variety of different um, kind of perspectives. Flexibility, right? Um, strength, like doing swells in the high range is, is really important. Because when you think about it, when you're trying to play high and then you introduce volume, that's a, that's a physical thing. You're trying to put a lot of air through a small aperture without letting it spread open and then introducing excess tension and, and pressure and force into the mix. So um, uh, swells is, an, is another aspect of it. Articulation and scales is another aspect uh, because uh, getting the, the high range to respond within that, you know, that context of, of articulation and immediacy is another discipline. So, um, and then all of this within the context of um, playing in, starting with whatever, whatever volume is most free for, for the player. So for me, I, I have my students play as softly as they can play freely when they're approaching the high range. At first, just to develop that kind of efficient and flexible range of motion between the, ra uh, the ranges and to make sure that they're um, really minimizing any excess pressure, any excess manipulation. And you can hear it, there's always clues in the sound, there's always clues in the feel. And you can kind of identify both things, sound and feel. You don't only listen to sound, you don't only feel, but you, if, when you combine those things, it gives you clues to tell you if you're on the right path. And that, that, kind, of, uh, that kind of taste for, uh, for both aspects, the feel and the sound, comes with time, and comes with maturity, um, but it's kind of like developing a good taste for ingredients if you're a chef, right? So. Um, yeah, so approaching the high range through um, flexibility, through, um, through swells, through strength building exercises, and uh, through articulation, um, and all kind of starting in a, in a softer, freer approach so that you're not uh, overly forcing and introduce, introducing more bad, so, bad um, habits. You know, one thing I like to keep, keep in mind when I'm dealing with anything in my practicing that needs improvement is how can I turn this into something that I can 
really succeed at like eight out of 10 times. You know, Whiff Rudd always talks about making things easy, you know, and it's something that we always forget. So um, if, if you make it too easy, if it's like something you can get 10 out of 10 times, you're probably not challenging yourself enough to grow. But if it's like you're getting it five out of 10 times, it's probably a little bit too much in the chaos zone, right? To the point where you're not gonna have enough successful repetitions to lead to consistent growth and tangible growth. So, um, and if you really think about it, usually you have to make things way easier than you think. Because as tribal players, we wanna, you, we wanna have this immediate progress. We don't like delayed gratification. We want it now, right? And so in our minds, we place ourselves a little higher than we actually are in reality. And I think that's really something that we all share in common. So I want to be here with my range. I want to be here with my, uh, my triple tonguing speed. And so in, in your mind, you only slow things down to, to a certain tempo when you should really go 20 clicks slower, right? Um, you, you, you approach your high range a little too high when you really should go down a third. That's one thing that I have my students do all the time is, is transpose down and it's a neglected art form because people just don't like transposing but um, <laughs> it's it pays dividends if you can force yourself to transpose things down to the range where you can have all of the characteristics of sound that you want and characteristics of expression and musicality um, and then slowly by little by little you kind of push the boundaries with that into uh, until you can um, achieve those same uh, results and characteristics in your in your high range. So um, that kind of that's simple questions. How do I make it easy? How do I make it to the point where I'm having consistent progress, and uh, so I can walk away from my practice room and feel like I accomplished something? You're building, you know, brick by brick of a wall of confidence, and um, that's so so important that you're cultivating that for yourself and you're practicing. What <clears throat> do you what do you find yourself? really harping on about lesson after lesson with your students. What is, like, what's kind of the Caleb Hudson-isms that you really find yourself repeating to, to every student? Sure. Well, a lot of it, especially for younger students, but not just younger students, a lot of my master's students struggle with time management too. Um, but time management and, um, and learning how to structure your day um, so that you're really dealing with everything that you need to be dealing with um, that can be a, a learning curve for, for some students. For some, they come in with, with a really diligent approach and um, there are other aspects that we need to address. But some students just need to have help with a mentor saying, all right, let's look at your schedule and lay out your day. And oh, you're practicing four hours at once starting at 10 p.m.? Let's, let's talk about that, <laughs> you know? Um, and you know, oftentimes I think some master students, they have it together, like they're, they got that master's in their degree title, you know. Um, but they sometimes need that structure too. Um, that is a, is a big thing. Um, and not every student's the same. So um, sometimes students will go through kind of like obsessive creative phases uh, where they'll, you know, they'll like do a lot of writing and, and uh, arranging and, and maybe they won't focus much time on their triple tonguing as they should. But I think it's for those students who show that kind of creativity, it's, it's important to like let them, give them a little, a little space to let them explore those things. Uh, so it's a very indiv individualized approach. It's not like I have my students all meet at 8 a.m. and they go practice at the same time and do the same thing. And, um, it's very individual and there's a balance of, of kind of introducing that structure of what, what it takes to, to be a well-rounded triple player and the commonalities that everyone shares with that versus like what it takes to kind of explore your own artistic voice. And um, a lot of students really don't, don't necessarily, they haven't had that permission or that, that um, kind of motivation to go explore that individualistic artistic voice. And um, that's something that, that I, I, I try to help cultivate, that, that kind of like imaginative approach. And so, you know, I'll have a student that just feels disillusioned because they're playing like French concertos all semester, and what they really want to be doing is playing Lucky Chops covers. You know, <laughs> so uh, I'm like, all right, go go arrange a brass band tune and come back and show me, and we'll work on the arrangement together next week. Yeah. You know, so recognizing that is really important. Other things that are neglected uh, that I find myself harping on is soft playing. Like I said before, soft playing is so so important. Um, um, also, let's see what else. Um, 
finding as many opportunities to perform as possible. So like a reluctance to play for for others, a reluctance to do mock auditions for others, a reluctance to to play through your recital repertoire for your, your friends and colleagues. That's something that should be in everyone's regular diet is playing for other people, you know, and sharing in, in that kind of community building aspect of it. Um, that and people just they don't slow down their, tri their triple tonguing enough. <laughs> nice. It's too choppy. Smooth out your multiple tonguing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's about that time. You guys are probably familiar. I know, Caleb, you're familiar. This is time for the Monster Round. The uh -oh. Monster Round is a series of rapid fire questions, stream of consciousness, first thing that comes into your mind. Uh, there's really low pressure, I promise. Yeah. It's, not, it's not really a big deal. But we want to get inside Caleb Hudson's head with the monster round. So here we go. Are you ready? No. All right, good. Who would win in a fight, Mark Gould now or Mark Gould in 2004? Oh, Mark Gould now. He has a new hip. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> What's the best advice you were ever given about trumpet playing? Ooh. Uh, Mark Gould uh, told me to always, hmm, always do the minimal change necessary to, to achieve your goal. What's your Mount Rushmore of trumpet pieces? Hmm. Does that mean difficulty or just like reverence? Reverence. Ooh. Um, B minor mass. Trumpet mouthpieces. Trumpet mouthpieces. Toshiyaki, all the way. <laughs> uh, what's on your Mount Rushmore of midnight snacks? I've been intermittent fasting for the past few months. It's great. If you weren't, what oh, would it okay. be? <laughs> Ice cream. Uh, and what is your Mount Rushmore of famous American monuments? <laughs> Mount Rushmore? <laughs> What's your secret to a really quick emergency warm-up? Hmm. Uh, secret to a quick emergency warm-up. Um, hitting the categories. 30 seconds of buzzing, 30 seconds of Chigowitz, one minute of lip flexibilities, and a little bit of lip trilling. What's the best advice you were ever given about piccolo trumpet playing? Play baroque trumpet instead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are the keys to playing high notes? Uh, balance and patience. Besides Monster Oil, who are your favorite trumpet-related social media follows? Oh, interesting. Charlie Porter. Uh, Sergei Nakaryakov, Wynton Marsalis. Am I missing someone else? No. Everyone understands the stream of consciousness. Okay. Okay. You are directed not to have hurt feelings if he missed you. Okay. Uh, how many times per year do you clean your trumpets? Hmm. When I was in high school, I did it once a month. Wow. Now? Not so much. <laughs> Not so much. That's an amount of time. <laughs> What's another career path you could realistically choose tomorrow? Carpenter. Ooh. What are your three desert island recordings and optional, a quick why about each? Oh, wow. Um, any genre? Any genre. Oh, okay. Desert uh, island, nothing for the rest <clears throat> of your life. You're stranded there until you starve or die or get off. This is Monster Round, so... Yeah. Don't hold me to this. Um, okay, the English Baroque soloist playing the Bach Brandenburg Concertos with uh, John Elliott Gardner. Yeah, it's an amazing recording. Um, man, this is tough. I I have to throw Roy, Roy Hargrove in there. I think he's my favorite jazz player. So um, uh, I don't know. I like ear food a lot. Okay, Roy Hargrove ear food. That's, that's great, especially the live YouTube video of that album um, where he's playing in, I think, France. Um, okay, and then the third one, wow, what would it be? Mm. What was the first one? <laughs> oh, Brandenburg, yeah, yeah. Oh man, this is not easy. It could be two, it could just be two. No, no, I, no, I have a lot, I just, uh, Okay, I'll just say, uh, just because I think he has the most vocal approach ever, Timothy Dockschutzer, um, the uh, arabesque recording. 
Uh, what's your all-time favorite performance venue? Hmm. The one that keeps coming to mind is the one in Lucerne, Switzerland, the KKL Hall. Um, it's an amazing, amazing concert hall, but there's, there's a lot. What's the best movie music moment for trumpet? Ooh. Um, movie music, probably... Um, it has to be John Williams, either... Oh, I'll, I'll give two. So I guess probably the theme from JFK with Tim Orson playing, or the Sphere with Phil Smith. You know that mm -hmm. track? Whew, amazing. If hostile aliens came to Earth intending to destroy us, That's a good segue. what music would you show them to prove the worth of the human race? I don't think they could be convinced. I think we'd have to play Baby Shark and hope their brains explode. <laughs> Baby Shark, <laughs> all right. Uh, how many practice hours per day do you average? Uh, when I'm not on the road, um, I, I'd say honestly at this point with three kids, I'm happy to get two and a half in. Wow. Yeah. What's the most nervous you've ever been on stage? This is a good story. This cannot be Monster Round because it's, it was uh, two nights ago. Yeah. So, so I'm diabetic, type 1 diabetes. I've had it for 14 years. I've never had an episode on stage until two nights ago when I had uh, my first hypoglycemic episode. And um, I started, uh, yeah, I was like, my, I, I wear a, a glucose monitor and it was like beeping at me in the performance and my blood sugar was up in the 30s. Normal blood sugar is in about 100. Mm -hmm. So um, 30 is severe hypoglycemia and I was starting to like black out on stage. Oh my God. And, drenched in sweat and like I I have no memory of the last piece at all. I played, apparently I played. I even double tongued. Did they clap? I don't know, I think. <laughs> but um oh, man. the our, I don't remember the last piece at all. The second to last piece um is when I started feeling and knowing like what was happening. And at that point I should have gone to the microphone and said, All right, my blood sugar's too low to continue. See you in ten minutes. But I tried to be a hero. So don't let that happen to all you <laughs> diabetics out there. That's amazing. And make sure you eat before performing. Wow. Um, OK. Mount Vernon's, legit or all hype? Oh, I mean, when you play a Mount Vernon, you know it's not, it's not hype. So yeah, I mean, every Mount Vernon I've tried has, has that character. Now, whether or not you want to make the trade-offs, I guess if there are trade-offs uh, between you know, ease and I always like to start with the, the character and like, does that resonate with me? You know, does the sound of this horn resonate with what I want to portray? Um, and Mount Vernon's, the, Mount Vernon's have character. You can't deny that. All right. What's your favorite thing to do to escape from trumpet? Uh, I like to do projects like woodworking projects or home projects, something where you can see immediate progress. Uh, if you had a billion dollars, what would you change about your life as it relates to trumpet? I get an MRI so I know exactly what's happening in my mouth when I'm playing. Uh, how often do you think about changing mouthpieces? Uh, um, six months. If you could gift one book to everyone in the world, what would it be? The Bible. Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars. What's the most thrilled you've ever been on stage? Ooh. Um, playing with New York Philharmonic Brass. What's your biggest trumpet regret? Biggest trumpet regret. Um, not playing piano first. <laughs> How many trumpets do you own? 17. What music made you first fall in love with trumpet? Um, first, Wynton Marsalis, Gabriel's Garden. Besides this interview, what was your worst gig? <laughs> um, ooh, that's tough. Worst gig. Um, probably playing outside um, in Toronto in the, in the middle of January. Yeah, that counts. And finally, what are you most looking forward to in 2024? Um, most looking forward to in 2024. Hmm. And that can be a segue to 
plug whatever you want, tell us about your projects, all of that yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, besides, you know, being with, with my family, I'm, I'm excited about releasing my album on March 15th. Uh, it's called Nothing Less, and it's really, um, it's a solo album, but it's also, you know, when I was thinking about what I wanted a solo album to be, um, <clears throat> I didn't want it, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't want it to be just like a, a showcase of technique, you know. Um, I wanted it to be like a, a creative, collaborative thing. So I got together a bunch of my favorite chamber musicians, um, which I'm here in Connecticut playing with tonight. And, um, and we did like a, a project of, <clears throat> we did a project of four brand new uh, works, one of which, which I wrote, and I got a couple of friends to write the other two, three. Um, in addition to a few arrangements of mine of Corelli and Philip Glass piano etudes, and the project is just one of the most artistically satisfying things I've done, and um, I really just have the most inspiration, uh, most respect for all of the uh, musicians involved in this project. Uh, it's for trumpet and violin, cello, clarinet, and flute. Um, I don't know if that combination has ever been recorded before, but um, I'm really excited about it. It's called Nothing Less. It's out on Mar March 15th, but there's a band, band camp pre-orders available now, and um, yeah, so you can get a physical CD. Awesome. Caleb Hudson, everybody, thank you so much. It's been a long time coming, and it was a pleasure talking Thanks, to you. Thanks, Joel. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Caleb. <laughs> Say it again.